This is John Kirby. Good job. Bring it here. This is Bear. Oh. And this is John's arthritic knee acting up. Every once in a while, it'll, it'll just lock up on me and it'll almost drop me to my knees. John's an active 60-something in good health, except for his unfortunate knees. A high school football injury, years of distance running, and a family history of arthritis eventually caught up with those knees. There's pain involved, but worse, John's had to give up some of the things he loves. I used to do an awful lot of, of backpacking and hiking, and um, I, I'm just not able to do that anymore, and I miss it. I, I, I love getting out into the mountains and in the woods and, you know, the peace. Come on, let's go inside. Let's get something to eat. Cross-country skiing is out, too, and John's bicycle sits unused in the midst of biker paradise. Maybe worst of all, he hasn't been able to go dancing with his fiance. I love this song. Sometimes when we are attempting to dance to this Cajun and the Zydeco music, there's a lot of pivoting and swiveling, and you can sometimes hear the, the, the knee crunching. It's, you know, basically bone on bone. John tried anti-inflammatory medications, activity modifications, and joint injections. When those failed to provide long-term relief from pain, John and his doctor agreed that knee replacement surgery was worth considering. Living with the pain and lack of mobility just wasn't an option for John. Mr. Kirby? Hi, oh, hi, come on back yeah. with me. Sure. The most common thing that really causes me a lot of pain is when it will lock up on me. And what that is is just a, a, a sharp pain that just makes me almost gasp. And then you know, there's a residual kind of a throbbing for, you know, the, the duration varies, but uh, anywhere from several minutes to even several hours. Right this, there. this looks familiar. Doesn't it? Eight months ago, John had his first knee replacement surgery at the University of Washington Medical Center. He researched his options and chose his surgeon carefully, finding someone who combined a high level of surgical skill with a high regard for his patient's emotional well-being. John says that Dr. Seth Leopold went to great lengths to answer all his questions and prepare him for the procedure. Once I learned what was involved in the procedure, that was, quite honestly, a little scary to me. And there is always some risk involved with surgery, especially with anesthesia. And, um, you know, just, you know, the thought that, oh, gosh, they're going to be cutting my whole knee out and putting these metal pins. And, uh, you know, it just sounded like, ooh. So it, it was, it was, it was scary, it was unsettling, and even though um, I felt pretty confident with Dr. Leopold because of the way we interacted, the information he gave me, the reassurances he gave me, uh, yeah, it, it, it's something you have to experience to, to really um, develop the confidence in. Hey, Dr. Hey, Leopold. Mr. Kirby. Good to see it. You too. Let's go ahead and uh, take a look at this knee. Sure. Now John's preparing to have his second knee replaced. And this time, the confidence is already there. All right, so this is the one we did last year? Yep. This one's working fine? It works great. Terrific. That's super. And get it fully straight. Go ahead and bend it up. Oh, you did super. A great motion. Is this the good knee now? Mm -hmm. All right, we'll see if we can get you another good one. When Dr. Leopold operated on John's right knee, he used a technique with a 30-year record of success. Now, as John prepares for surgery on his left knee, they've decided on a newer and somewhat different approach. The way it was explained to me is that the incision, they have to first cut the quadriceps muscle, and then they go down from the knee, and it's all seven or eight inches long. And uh, the new procedure, the less invasive one, is they're going to be going in on the, more on the side of the knee, and they won't have to cut the quadriceps. And so Dr. Leopold's experience has been is that the recovery and the rehab is relatively much shorter. It's called minimally invasive or quadriceps sparing knee replacement surgery. John is considered a good candidate for this procedure. 
In many ways, Mr. Kirby is an ideal candidate for the less invasive approach to the knee, the quadriceps sparing approach. He is slender. The alignment of his knee is close to what we call neutral, which is fairly straight. Uh, and so those two things taken together uh, make, it, make getting into somebody's knee a little bit easier. New surgical instruments developed for this procedure allow the quadriceps sparing surgery to be done safely and accurately with less trauma to the knee joint. Dr. Leopold began performing the surgery in Seattle shortly after those instruments became available. This is a model of a knee replacement using the same kind of components that we would put in whether we did a traditional approach or the minimally invasive approach. In this model you can see there's a thigh bone here and the shin bone here. This component here is on the end of the thigh bone and it's placed on after we machine or cut the end of the femur or thigh bone to the same shape that the component is and it's attached with bone cement. It's made out of cobalt chrome which is a type of steel and that's why it's pretty shiny. And this is exactly the same as the one that we would put in in the operating room though of course that one would be sterile. This is the upper end of the shin bone which we prepare also by squaring off with a nice flat cut. This grayish metal is titanium. In between the two metal components is a plastic bearing material. This is polyethylene resin and it's very slippery and very durable. What isn't shown in this model is the kneecap and that's so that you can see into the knee. Obviously when we work on a, a regular person we deal with the kneecap as well and you'll see that at surgery. The important things to realize as you look at this model is how key it is to get the cuts just right. And it's one of the major skill moves during the operation that we have to uh, take care of. This cut wants to be perpendicular so that when the person walks on it, the weight is borne evenly over the bone. And at the end of the operation, very much like hanging a door, if you're building your house, you want the weight-bearing line to be absolutely straight coming down through the middle part of the knee. And so getting this alignment just right is one of the important things that we do at surgery. The other important thing that we do at surgery is get the balance of the knee just right, to get the, the tension in the ligaments to be symmetric so that from one side to the other, it's about the same. This obviously is rubber bands, and people don't have rubber bands for ligaments, but getting that tension just right is important to allow people to get their range of motion back, but at the same time to have good stability when they walk. Here's another model of a knee. This knee doesn't have a knee replacement in it. And what I want to show you on this is some of the important differences between the newer, less invasive technique and the traditional approach. Here again you have the thigh bone and the top part of the shin bone, and here's the kneecap. With the traditional approach to knee replacement, it involves a pretty extensive exposure of the knee that initially begins with dividing the quadriceps tendon or the tendon of the thigh muscle lengthwise. After you divide that, you actually have to turn the kneecap out 180 degrees. And that gives you a good exposure, a very, a very good exposure of the knee. Um, but you can see it doesn't look particularly gentle on the tissues either. After you get that kind of exposure of the knee, using the traditional approach, not only do you evert or dislocate the kneecap, but you actually have to dislocate the knee for a portion of it to pull the thigh bone off of the shin bone in order to get a good view of the upper part of the shin bone to make sure the cuts are in the right alignment. Now with the newer, less invasive approach, it's not so traumatic to the tissues. With this approach, we don't actually divide the tendon of the thigh muscle at all. The incision is moved a little bit over to the side and we come underneath it. And so we begin, rather than by flipping the kneecap out altogether, with the less invasive approach, we just tip it up, do the work that we need to do on the underside of the kneecap, and slide the kneecap out of the way. Then we're able to bend the knee, but we don't bend it as aggressively or as deeply as we have to with the traditional approach. We have special cutting guides that are smaller and smoother and allow us to make the cuts from the side so that we can do it with the knee positioned much more gently. And so this is really as much as the knee is ever bent in the course of the less invasive approach until the very end of the operation when we're testing to make sure that the person has full range of motion. I think that this combination of differences makes patients more comfortable after the operation. Ligaments are fine. Of course, John's also interested in the way his knee will look on the outside after the surgery. I'm just going to show you what to expect in terms of an incision. Here's your old incision from last year. It goes just about seven inches straight down the front of the knee. The newer way, what we're going to do is come in from the side and usually we don't need uh, nearly so much of an incision. It's usually from the top of the kneecap just to the top of the shin bone and a little beyond that. So I would guesstimate in you maybe four. And the guy as tall as you, four 
inches or so, four, four and a half inches, mm -hmm. in a slightly different location, so you won't be an exact match set because okay. you had the one done the old way and you're going to get the other one done the less invasive way. So that's what to expect after in terms of the appearance of it. On the inside, x-rays show how damaged John's knee really is. This is a picture of a knee that's very nearly normal. This is a thigh bone, this is the shin bone, and between the thigh bone and the shin bone you can see a smooth black line that goes all the way across. It looks like space there, but really that smooth black line is joint surface cartilage. If you want to imagine what, or think of what that is, it's like the white shiny stuff on top of the chicken bone when you break that open. In a person of normal uh, height and weight, it should be about as thick as a barrel uh, of the pen. And so this is a knee that doesn't show much arthritis, if any. Over here you can see a very different appearance. This is our patient. And here again is the thigh bone. Here's the shin bone. There should be a smooth black line going all the way across. And you can see part of his knee shows a black line, and that's the bearing surface or joint surface cartilage. But for a large portion of the knee, in his case on the outside of the knee, that cartilage is worn completely through, and he's rubbing thigh bone against shin bone with no bearing pad between them to serve to cushion the load each time he takes a step. That causes the grinding and the pain and the catching that patients with arthritis often describe. The other things that you can see on this x-ray are bone spurs, these abnormal margins of heaped up bone that you see here that you don't see on the outside of the other x-ray. This is a side view of our patient's knee. And since we're coming from the side, you can see the kneecap out in front. So he's facing this way. Around the kneecap, these pointy bits of bone here are bone spurs. And the spurs themselves aren't painful, but they do reflect the abnormal loading that's going on around his knee because he's lost his joint surface cartilage. You also see some bone spurs around the back of the knee. So this man has got both severe and very diffuse arthritis affecting all of the surfaces in his joint. What you can see here is he did have last year uh, another knee replacement, and this shows a well-aligned knee replacement. This wants to be perpendicular. There's a good mantle of cement showing that it's well attached to the bone. This black line going across, just like in the normal knee, is the bearing surface, although now this bearing surface is polyethylene, which is a type of plastic rather than cartilage. And overall, the alignment of this uh, knee is just perfect. The point of attachment to bone appears very solid, and so this would be a good-looking knee replacement. After either traditional or minimally invasive knee replacement, there is some pain and rehabilitation to go through. John's commitment to his physical therapy will be vital to getting the best result. That will include working to bend his knee even in the early post-operative period. You were saying this is a less invasive, but does that translate into it being perhaps a quicker rehab and recovery process? Yeah, that's a, good, that's a good question. That's an important topic. And the idea of it is to get you back on your feet as quickly as possible. You know from your last experience that you get nice results with knee replacements mm -hmm. and you can regain a good deal or most of the function that you had before you had arthritis with a good knee replacement. Mm -hmm. But I know you remember also that you have to invest quite a bit to get that result in terms of post-operative pain and limitations and, and physical therapy. The newer approach, the less invasive approach, uh, is nice because it's gentler on the tissues around the knee. The incision's shorter. I stay out of the quadriceps tendon, mm -hmm. which is important for your walking. Uh, and we're just gentler all around in terms of the exposure of the joint. What that translates to you is typically less post-operative pain, typically a shorter hospital stay, less need for therapy afterwards, whereas uh, with the traditional approach, people are usually in therapy for six to eight weeks before mm -hmm. you really start to mm -hmm. feel like you don't need it anymore. With this, it's more commonly a few weeks to a month, and most people are taking less pain medicine after this approach compared to the traditional approach, and walking independently earlier. That's important to John. He lives in an idyllic setting, but it's not very convenient during extended rehabilitation. Patricia, his fiance, had her hands full after John's first surgery. When they did the right knee, I was very dependent. I mean, Patricia took some time off from work, and you know, for three weeks the physical therapist had to come out here because I couldn't drive. And uh, you know, even when I was able to go places or needed to go places, uh, it was difficult just to get in and out. And and being out here, of course. Uh, you know, the nearest store is uh, nine miles away. Grocery store is nine miles away. 
we observe that patients who have this approach seem to have less pain after the surgery. They seem to get out of the hospital uh, considerably faster than my patients who are having the traditional approach we're getting out before. Uh, most of my patients with this approach are walking much earlier than they had been with the traditional approach and getting rid of their crutches and cane much earlier than they would have. They're taking less pain medication and requiring less physical therapy. Dr. Leopold points out that quadriceps sparing knee replacement surgery is still a new procedure and is somewhat more complicated than traditional knee surgery. It's important to ask questions before deciding on both your surgeon and your choice of procedure. So when you're meeting the surgeon, even if the surgeon comes recommended, I think it's important that you ask some good direct questions. Most surgeons are very comfortable answering these questions. Uh, we get them all the time, and I certainly would ask them before I had an operation. I would want to know what the background and experience of the person performing it was. Uh, I think it's very reasonable to ask that person, has he or she done a fellowship in joint replacement surgery? That's an additional year or two uh, of uh, study focused entirely on how to perform knee replacements uh, efficiently and effectively. I think it's reasonable to ask that person how many of them, how many knee replacements he or she has performed. And as important as that is how many has he or she performed in the last year. Knee replacement is a complex operation, like many major surgeries are, and the more times that surgeon has performed it, and the more current that person is, the better trained, that is with a fellowship, the more likely uh, that the outcome is going to go the way you'd like it to. Hey, doing? Good. On June 7th, two weeks after not dancing at his wedding, John returned to the University of Washington Medical Center for his second knee surgery. And you've decided on a spinal with the anesthesiologist? Yeah, sounds good to me. I think that's a good choice. Okay. Right. Any, anything I can answer for you? No, nope. you've done a pretty good job prepping me, so I'm ready. Let's get the show on the road, shall we? That's good. Okay, incision. John's surgery took about an hour and 10 minutes. These are a few highlights. Be prepared for some fairly graphic footage. Here's the top of the kneecap. We can see the quad muscle coming in here. We're going to enter the knee joint from the inside part in a way that's going to let us come underneath the quadriceps rather than through it. Slap hammer extractor. So we're taking the arthritic end of the thigh bone off. And we're going to be reshaping the end of the bone to accept the joint replacement component. Arthritis is the most common reason for knee replacement surgery. Arthritis comes in a variety of forms. There's a family of conditions called inflammatory arthritis, and this includes rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and things that are like gout that can affect the knee. Um, and then there is uh, a condition called osteoarthritis, which is by far the most common. Uh, people used to call it wear and tear arthritis or degenerative joint disease. Most of the knee replacements that are done are for osteoarthritis. A smaller number are done for post-traumatic arthritis. That's from breaking your knee, having a fracture that didn't heal well. And that's a minority of the knee replacements that we do. And very, very rarely we do them for tumors and malignant conditions about the knee. This is one of those cutting guides that was designed particularly to let us get into the knee through less exposure. The old one used to cut from the front. You needed a lot more exposure, and that's why we wound up taking the quadriceps. This quadriceps sparing technique, while still major surgery, is a much more gentle approach than traditional knee replacement surgery. The knee isn't dislocated, for one thing. The knee is not bent excessively, and in the traditional approach to knee replacement, the knee in this point of the case is going to be hyperflexed, very, very bent and uh, oftentimes dislocated, and in his case, it's held in a very gentle position, looks like about 75 degrees of flexion, and that's all we'll need to do this part of the case, which previously had been done by dislocating the knee. It's one of the things that makes it less invasive and less painful probably afterwards, is how gently we're able to handle the joint compared to what was done previously. There are a number of factors that can impact the likelihood that a knee replacement is going to remain well-functioning and in service for more than a decade which is really the goal. We don't do these operations for two or three year successes. We do these operations, we hope, for successes into the second decade and perhaps beyond. Many of those factors are technical, having to do with how the surgeon puts the device in. Alignment is crucial. The final alignment check with the device pinned in place to make sure that the alignment falls right over that dotted line. And that's telling us that the alignment is just right. Even the best outcome won't be quite the same as having the knees of a 20-year-old. Realistic expectations are important. 
as people are living younger, uh, the decisions on when to intervene for elective knee surgery in particular uh, become a little more challenging in many ways. Uh, there are issues related to the durability of the implants that we're using. And they're as durable now as they've ever been. In fact, there are many innovations in implant design and materials that are making them perhaps last longer than they would have lasted uh, a decade ago. So these are the polyethylene bearing surfaces for the shin bone and for the kneecap. This is going to go into the shin bone. It's got a keel like a keel on a boat. It's going to give us a little extra surface area for cement. And here's the femoral component. It's on an inserter, but you can see it's cobalt chrome, which is silver. This is the surface for cement, and this is the surface that's going to face the joint. The fact that people who now are 60 are living like 45-year-olds, it can become a challenge because when we do a knee replacement, we're not doing it with the goal of getting somebody back to playing basketball or getting back to jogging. Um, the implants aren't designed for that, and they won't function well if they're subjected to those kinds of loads. And so there is a judgment piece that comes in as to whether or when to intervene in somebody based on their age, activity level, and the demands or activities that they want to resume. Fortunately for John, dancing and bicycling should be fine. And this operation is going as well as his earlier, more traditional surgery. So here's the final device in place. Here's the thigh bone component or the femoral component. This grayish metal is titanium. Here's the bearing surface, just like we showed you in the office. And what you can see is that he gets full extension without me having to push on it. In other words, the knee comes fully straight. And he can bend deeply just with gravity. You don't have to lean on it. His ligaments are stable in both directions, which is just what you want. The kneecap is tracking right in the groove of the component there, just the way you want it, like a train on a track. So we're going to go ahead and put a drain in and close them up, but that's, uh, that's the operation. As with any major surgery, there are risks and possible complications. The risks are similar for traditional or minimally invasive knee replacement. There's a risk of an infection anytime you open up the knee joint. With the precautions that all surgeons take, that risk can be maintained at a very low level, less than 1% in most series that have been published on it. Whenever you operate around a joint, it's possible to injure a nerve, and some of those injuries, in fact, could leave you worse off after than you were before because of pain or limitations. That, too, in most knee replacements, is well less than 1%. The other risks that have to do with the knee itself is the possibility that I do my best and the patient does his or her best in therapy but still winds up with a knee that doesn't function as well as they'd like. For a skilled surgeon, failure is rare. Less than an hour after surgery, John's feeling pretty well. With the less invasive approach, quadriceps control can come back right away in the recovery room in most people. Mm -hmm. And go ahead and lift your leg straight off the bed. So he's got control over his quadriceps. Go ahead and bend your knee wow. and straighten your knee. Stra yeah. Straighten it up and bend it and straighten it. And so you remember how long it took to get that after yeah. your last operation, right? I and mean, that was a few weeks yeah. ago. Yeah, they had the help me the next day. It was kind of painful then. Right. So you've got quadriceps control now, which means that you can fire your own quadriceps because it hasn't been cut. Yeah. And it's not stitches holding it together. And so it's, uh, that's going to help. We hope to get you walking earlier than you were able to walk after the last procedure. And so that's one of the advantages of the newer approach. I like it. Okay. The particular specialty that I do has uh, rewards that I think are unique to this part of orthopedics. We very commonly see patients who, when they come into the office, have difficulty walking, have pain with walking. Indeed, some of them can't walk. And we do some work together, uh, the work that I do in the operating room and the work that the patient then does in physical therapy to rebuild strength and balance. And it's not at all uncommon to take somebody literally from a wheelchair to being able to ambulate in the community. And that's, that's extremely satisfying to me. It's not always so dramatic. Uh, very commonly, I have patients who are not nearly that disabled, but come in because they're in their retirement and aren't enjoying their retirement because of pain. So they can walk, but they can't walk comfortably, or they can't walk as far as they'd like, or they enjoy golfing or dancing and find that it's difficult to do those things because of pain. And again, we do some work together on their knee or their hip and get them to a place where they can do it comfortably. All right, Mr. Kirby, why don't you come on out and let me see you walk. Okay. That looks great. All right. That looks terrific. Come on back towards me. Wow, that's, that's great. That's perfect. Eleven days later, results are looking very good. John's having his first post-surgical checkup with Dr. Leopold. Can you lift that leg and keep it straight? Mm -hmm. 
That's great. So you've got terrific quad control. How much can you bend it? So just just on your own. That's great. Straighten it out. That's a good 105, 110 of that warming up. Let it come down. Good. Let me have you bend it up again. That's great. That's just as best you can. Nice and floppy. Relax that knee. Oh, that's great stability. So the swelling that you have in here is going to take probably a few weeks to pass. That's not at all uncommon mm -hmm. to have that. And as that swelling goes out, um, you're going to get even better bend. Mm -hmm. And you've got terrific bend with this end. Let's have it come up one more time. Okay. Yeah, yeah. it feels good. That's great. That's beautiful motion. That's beautiful motion. Mm -hmm. Terrific. John still has some physical therapy to do. And for another week, he'll be using a cane when he walks outdoors. Joe is going to come in and take out your staples. Okay. And we'll have you uh, come back in a month for some x-rays. Okay. I'll Sounds good. I'll see you then. Thank you so much. Okay, Mr. Kirby. You want to go outside? Yeah. Where's Frisbee? A month after surgery, John and Bear are playing Frisbee again. And this time, there's no pain involved. I'm feeling really good. Um, after about two weeks, I was not using any aid walking at all, whereas with the other knee, I was, I was using that walker probably for the first two, three weeks, and then a cane for a couple weeks after that. So, you know, two weeks versus six weeks. John does the exercises his physical therapist showed him, including riding his stationary bike for 15 minutes a day. And he's getting back to the things he loves to do. I've actually been riding my regular bike, too. Um, nothing real strenuous or demanding, nothing really uphill, but yeah. He's looking forward to some hiking soon, too. I haven't tried it yet, but I feel really capable of going on some hikes now. No rock scrambles yet, but uh, yeah, some hikes I can handle. So that, that's really nice, too, because before, you know, sometimes just walking, uh, it would lock up on me. Not anymore. With his surgery behind him and brand new knees, John's ready to get on with his life. And he's doing it very well. Yeah, it doesn't get too much better than this.